Welcome back to History and Politics on Tuesday at four o'clock when I try and answer your questions about politics and modern uh, modern day issues. Uh, a bunch of things I want to get to today, but I want to start with one that somebody asked a month ago and I kept saying, I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get to it and ended up not having time for. And that is um, the question of campaign finance, which is a really interesting question. Um, so the whole issue of how you fund a campaign and the relationship between money and voting is actually really central to our democracy. And it is an absolutely fascinating issue because of the way it's changed over time, along with media and along with the accumulation of large amounts of money. So I want to start there just because I think it's really cool. And then I'm going to get to some other questions that you've asked as well. So I want to start with the idea of, you know, how did people originally pay for financial, you know, make, make, do, take care of their financial needs in a campaign? Well, generally campaigns were self-financed until the, uh, the middle of the 19th century. But what does that actually look like? It looks like um, people generally would um, pay for printing because they're not going to be out there touring around themselves. They're going to be making sure that people get things in the mail. One of the reasons that we uh, care so much about the U.S. Postal Service is being able to send material across the country. But also you would have, um, generally, if you were looking to become a senator, you would speak in public and you'd have to pay for your money to go around your state, but um, the way Lincoln did in 1858. But generally, um, that would that would be money that would go to um, central you know central organizations. So generally, there wasn't really a good system of campaign finance in the 19th century, with the exception of the fact that if you held a public office of any sort, right down from being a postmaster to being a senator, there was an expectation that you would kick in a portion of your salary into the general pot in order to get more people from your party elected. And that was really the heart of the patronage system, the idea that if you held a job in the, the federal government, you would pay for the privilege in a sense. You would you would you were expected to kick back a certain percentage of your salary in order to make sure that your party stayed in power. So that's the system that exists in America until 1867. And 1867 is kind of a banner year for campaign changes because in that year there's an appropriations um uh, a bill that goes through Congress, and in the it's a naval appropriations bill, and in that naval appropriations bill, they Congress specifies that uh, naval officers and government employees cannot solicit money from the navy yard workers, can't make them kick into um, into that central pot, and that's really the first time anybody says, hey, this maybe not is not such a great idea to be financing our um, our system this way. And that's one of the first things that liberal Republicans like Carl Schurz get grant on is Schurz's big speech in Congress in I think it's 69. He comes out and he, he, he sort of rips the cover off this system and says that Grant is only staying in power by basically hitting all the other Republican um, uh, government, uh, government officers or people who are holding an office under the government by hitting them up for campaign money. And it's just the way it's done. It's actually really, if you will, institutionalized under Andrew Jackson, who's a Democrat and who really makes this the system on which this, the the government works in the 1830s. That's when we get that expression to the victor go to spoils. But um, but the, he, uh, Schertz tries to pin it on Grant as a sign of his corruption. And by then, people are sort of um, starting to think that maybe it's not a great idea to have people in government literally having to pay for the privilege of having that job, because of course, that's where it becomes part of a business instead of being theoretically part of a system that's in place for the good of, of the country. So what happens from that is in 1872, and I've talked about this a lot, um, when Grant runs for president because of the weird stuff going on in New York City at the time, he really ends up uh, really wedding the Republican Party to big business. And in the 1872 election, you have big business really kind of stepping in and saying, you know, maybe there's not enough money if we're just asking, you know, postmasters for money. Why don't we just write some pretty large checks to make things happen? 
And there's a period after this, after 72, when it's kind of expected that people interested in the election, because they're interested largely in continuing the tariffs that protect big business, are going to cough up cash to keep their politicians in power. Um, but this changes uh, dramatically in 1883. And with the Pendleton Act of 1883, also known as the Civil Service Act, we get the rise of the idea of a civil service, of, the, uh, of people who are in office because they're good at what they do and they want to engage in public service, not because they're looking to get a payoff from the government that they're going to kick some money back into in order to stay in power. And the Civil Service Reform of 1883, which is passed after the assassination of James Garfield, and because the, the guy who shot Garfield, he was obviously mentally ill, but when he, after he shot um, Garfield, he indicated that he expected having assassinated Garfield would win him points with a different wing of the party and would therefore get him a job. With that, uh, that assassination, we get this idea of a, of a nonpartisan civil service. Not a bipartisan, but a nonpartisan civil service. And the idea there being that you need to have a government that is not about what you're going to get out of it, but is rather about serving the country. So it would be lovely for me to stop right there, except for the fact, obviously, this creates a big problem in an era when you've got um, more need, you know, more increasing media and more need for candidates to get the word out. Now, they're still not going to be touring uh, and going around and giving speeches. That's really not done, especially among presidents, but they're still going to need a lot of money to get their message out. So what happens is in 1888 with the campaign of um, Benjamin Harrison, we get modern campaign, uh, modern campaign financing. And this fascinates me because it's such a picture of the late 19th century. It's actually conceived of by John Wanamaker, who is the Philadelphia entrepreneur who comes up with the idea of um, the, the department store. And Wanamaker realizes, as the Republican Party does at the time, that if, in fact, the Democrats continue their increasing popularity, um, the Republicans are going to lose their signature issue, which is the issue of the tariff. And that tariff protects American business. And the tariff walls are high enough by 1888 that they enable the industrialists inside America to collude to raise prices. And so they're really like making bank in this period. And this is when you get the era of the the, the cottages at Newport, like the breakers, those giant mansions that were the getaway homes of the very, very wealthy, especially New York industrialists. And this is the period when you have wealth concentrating upward dramatically. And um, the, the Republican Party really has come to believe by 1887, right before the election, that if that tariff is altered in any way, uh, it's going to destroy America, and it's going to be the apocalypse, and the Democrats are going to essentially usher in a system of leveling, as they say, that's going to destroy this very wealthy class. And that very wealthy class, Republicans believe, is vital to maintaining the, um, the economy and to guaranteeing that the country moves forward. So they're adamant that they can't lose that tariff. So what are they going to do? How are they going to convince a majority of Americans, who, by the way, have just elected Grover Cleveland, president in 1884, the first Democrat to be elected into the White House since uh, the Civil War, since James Buchanan in 1856, before the Civil War. How are they going to combat this popular media out there and the speakers that are traveling across the country and you know, sort of the news, that the, the tide that has turned against the Republicans? And what John Wanamaker comes up with is a new system of financing. And what he does is he goes around to these industrialists who want to keep the tariffs, and he says, Pony up the cash so we can, you know, educate voters to make sure that they are going to understand just how important a tariff is. And that system of what's create, called creating a war chest, it was actually sort of known as the war chest, um, is the first time that there was a systematic effort to go around and basically done payments out of industrialists to support the Republican Party in any kind of a systemic way. Um, it, and it works in a way, as I keep saying on um, these things, um, uh, 
Benjamin Harrison loses the popular vote by about 100,000 votes, but the Republicans do take the House and they do take the Senate and they, they the Republicans manage to do a kind of a switcheroo in the New York delegation of the Electoral College and put Benjamin Harrison into the White House. And of course, they do all kinds of things once there to try and preserve their majority. This is, a, as I keep saying, when we get those six new American states to try and pack the Senate and the Electoral College, and this is when we get um, certain new voter reforms to try and keep Democratic voters away from the polls, especially in New York City. And this is when we get um, things like the Wounded Knee Massacre that I won't talk about now, but is vitally um, tied to this whole attempt to keep Republican control of, of uh, Congress and of the federal government. So Wanamaker seems to have one, I mean, he seems to have created this fabulous new system. And you see this not in um, 1892 when the Democrats win again, simply because there's such a backlash against the Republican Party after they say they're going to reform the tariff, but they actually raise the tariff. And I've talked about that a lot. Um, I mean, it sounds really stupid and boring in your in your textbooks, you know, the McKinley Tariff of 1890, who cares? Well, the, you care because if you were alive in 1890, what that says is the rich guys are just taking more and more and more. And the Democrats, as I have said before, when that passes in Congress, they're literally screaming over each other and people are struggling with each other. And when it passes, the Republicans start cheering and laughing and the Democrats say, who are sitting across the aisle, literally across the aisle. That's what moving across the aisle means. Look over and say, you laugh now, but in November you'll mourn. And that's precisely what happens. The Democrats win the midterm elections of 1890. And then in 1892, they put Grover Cleveland back into the White House, electing him with the majority of the popular vote for the third time. And they make the House and the Senate also democratic. And this makes it look as if the tariffs are going down in flames. They're not going to, and I'm not going to tell you the rest of that story now, although if anybody's interested, I will someday. But what matters for that is that the Republicans are like, we must win in 1896. So what happens in 1896 is that um, uh, the system that Wanamaker has pioneered in 1888 kind of goes on to steroids. And in 1896, uh, an industrialist named Mark Hanna, who is going to become really the kingpin of the Republican Party, simply uh, cuts a check to 100,000 bucks for 100,000 bucks to McKinley, uh, who's the Republican nominee for president. And $100,000 in 1896, well, let's just say a good living. In, in 1896, a good living for uh, a, an average American was about $300 a year. So for him to cut a check for $100,000, I haven't done the math myself, but it's a significant chunk of money that he turns around and writes to McKinley. And from then on, uh, Mark Hanna is going really to systematize this whole system of big business financing campaigns and, and the financing and systematizing the, um, the system that Wanamaker has come up with. And again, I see people are commenting about sort of learning about America at this point. So I just want to point out, and, and I'll go back to the campaign financing in a minute. Think about the era. It's the 1890s. People are thinking about systems and about you know mechanization and about you know making things work more efficiently and about uh, economies of scale. And it kind of makes sense that they're looking at. In, in, uh, I'm sorry, elections the same way. They're just trying to be efficient and let's put the money here and let's do this and let's do that. And it's, it, it just kind of fits for the moment, but so will the next stage fit, fit for the moment. And that is that progressives look at this, people who are very worried about big business taking over American society, look at this. And they're like, this is nuts. I mean, Mark Hanna just basically bought the election and Mark Hanna's a, a jerk. Um, they don't put it quite that way, but they're horrified at how much power Mark Hanna has. And so um, they start to say, we got to take American politics back from the rich people. So they start to back a lot of new things to try and make sure that that's going to happen. They work for the spread of the secret ballot to make sure that um, industry, industrial leaders can't dictate the way that their workers vote, because until then, ballots are printed by a party and they are color coordinated, so you can't split the ticket. You have to, to vote the way that, I mean, it's very obvious which way you're voting. And the tickets are big, so you, you, you know, people know how you're voting. And literally in the election of 1888, a number of employers simply say to their workers, vote Republican or don't come to work in, in the morning. 
And so the idea of a secret ballot that's printed by the government that is plain colored so people can vote however they want is a, a really big reform to try and get money out of the system. It does also, of course, require people to know how to read, which is going to change who votes in America. But that's one of the things that progressives want. They want a secret ballot. They also want um, women's suffrage. And this is an interesting shift because they think that women are more honest and less likely to be swayed by financial considerations than men, and that if you have women voting, that's going to clean up the ballot a lot. And they also want to, um, to limit how much money rich people can put into campaigns, essentially. They're looking for some kinds of limits on campaign financing. So uh, when Teddy Roosevelt gets into power, Teddy Roosevelt, as Teddy Roosevelt always does, sort of bloviates about you know, how rich people shouldn't be owning campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. But then in his own reelection campaign of 1904, he takes corporate money. After that, um, he later says that any kind of um, uh, um, big business contributions to political campaigns should be prohibited. But Teddy Roosevelt really kind of gets religion, if you will, after um, after he leaves office and then as he comes back swinging as a really progressive candidate for the Bull Moose Party in 1912, he sings a very different tune than he did in 1904. Anyway, so, uh, so what happens after that is that he, again, keeps trying desperately to get uh, Teddy Roosevelt and other progressives want more uh, transparency about who's actually funding elections, you know, how things are, are actually, um, who is actually getting the, the, the voice to put people in office. And, and again, let me just step back for a second. Why do we care about this? We care about it because um, there's really a problem in American democracy if in fact you are going to argue that people are swayed by argument into voting for one candidate or another, who controls the arguments basically means who gets to control the, the government. And that has to do with the mechanics of who gets to vote, for example, but it also has a lot, a lot, a lot to do with control of the media. And I don't necessarily mean television, of course, when we're talking about Teddy Roosevelt, we're not talking about television. I'm talking about who gets who gets heard, you know, whose newspapers stay in print, um, whose books get read, who gets to go on tours so that their voices are listened to. And that's why this campaign financing matters as much as it does. It's not like they're using that money to, you know, hire posses of people to go kill voters at, um, at polling places in the North. They certainly were in the South, by the way, but they didn't have to hire them. Um, but the question is, who has the money to get the word out? So that's why we care about this. Anyway, not only progressives, but also it was not totally inadvertent. I mentioned, um, Get, keeping people from the polling places because the first real reform we get for federal spending is in um, 1907 with the Tillman Act, which is named for Ben Tillman, who's just this fascinating, fascinating um, white supremacist in the South. Anyway, he um, he the, the Tillman Act of, 60, of 1907 says that um, corporations and banks could not give to federal candidates for office. And corporations, of course, in this period are really quite large organizations. They're kind of different than companies. A corporation is uh, a specific legal um, identification in the 19th century that is different than a company because of the way it's capitalized. I don't think that really matters for the this except the idea that corporations are going to be the real big guys. They're going to say that, you know, if I'm home making shoes, I can give to a candidate if I'm still a company, but a corporation can't do that. And then in 1910 and 1911, progressives expand this to say that uh, senators and representatives have to disclose where their money is coming from. These are called for, calling for disclosure statements. And again, here you see Teddy Roosevelt's emphasis on transparency. Yeah, go ahead and take money, but tell us where it's coming from so we know who's giving to your campaign. And then in 1925, uh, the, the, the government limits how much money can be given to a campaign. So now you don't only have to say that you're doing it, you, you can't take as much as you might like to. Then in 1939, the Hatch Act sets limits for the funding that corporations can give to, to individual candidates. And you can see this increasing um, reining in of large efforts to control the national conversation. 
And then in 1943 and 1947, after reining in how much corporations can say, the government actually begins to rein in how much labor, you, how much money labor unions can put into um, into campaigns with, again, the idea that you're trying to set limits on how much large organizations can uh, can control the political conversation. All right, so then it's kind of a break until Watergate. And Watergate changes a lot of what we do politically in America. A lot of those reforms, by the way, obviously have not lasted, have not taken, but there were attempts after Watergate to make a lot of changes. So one of the things that happens after Watergate is Congress tries to establish a system of public funding for campaigns, and that really isn't terribly effective. But they also create the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, and that's a really interesting organization and a really important organization. And I urge you, if you're on Twitter, to follow Ellen Weintraub, who's the... Um, the chair of the FEC. And the FEC has not actually been able to meet and has no quorum now uh, for has not for years because Trump has not appointed anybody to it. So there aren't enough people on it for it to do anything. Another one of those things where they, I, at the, you know, apparently it's okay not to appoint people, but that means that has essentially gutted our Federal Elections Commission. Interestingly enough, um, other people have picked up the work of the FEC, and one of the reasons that um, my friends, I, I, and I mean that in the, I guess a snarky way, actually, um, of Igor Fruman and Lev Parnas, the way that they were picked up was actually one of the people who has tried to take over for uh, the FEC um, with an organization I can't believe I can't remember the name of, uh, has... Um, uh, he, he, he's the one who noticed really large payments coming from people who otherwise shouldn't have had money. And he's the one who flagged the, he's one of the two people who flagged um, the, the, the payments going from uh, Parnas and Fruman into Republican coffers in, in that election. Um, anyway, he's a really interesting guy. Maybe the day will come when I can write about him. He actually was... Uh, I think it's George W. Bush's campaign on his campaign. I forget exactly how he's connected to the, the Republicans, but he is a bright guy, very smart guy. Anyway, um, so after Watergate in 74 uh, and the creation of the FEC, something interesting happens. And that's in 1976, we get a case called Buckley v. Vallejo. And this is interesting because Buckley in this is William F. Buckley Jr.'s older brother. Uh, a guy named um, James L. Buckley, and he had been a Republican congressman. He's actually a, a, a movement conservative. He's a very conservative gentleman. And he argued that um, the, the limits on how much you can give to campaigns stifled free speech and that these limits were unconstitutional. So um, in Buckley v. Vallejo, we start to get the removal of the the limits on how much money can flow into a campaign. And that's in 18, I'm sorry, 1976. And then from 18, so, the, so then you've got uh, money beginning to pour back into campaigns in the 80s. And in 1994 through 1996, Democrats tried desperately to get campaign reform so that you they, they shut off the spigot of money, essentially going into Republican campaigns. And every time they did that, it got killed by uh, Republicans who didn't want to stop the spigot uh, from going into the, into campaigns. So there's a big fight for a while about, and let me just tell you as a historian, sort of saying there's a big fight for a while, like strikes to my heart, but I'm trying not to be too much longer on this. Um, and finally, we get a, a bipartisan bill, and that is popularly known as McCain-Feingold. It's from 2002. It's actually officially known as the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. And, the, and it's, of course, named for John McCain, who's a Republican, and Russ Feingold, who's a Democrat. And it was an attempt to regulate or to prohibit um, the large contributions, the sort of unlimited contributions that were going into, um, into uh, national committees and into political parties. So there's a distinction here between soft money in politics and hard money in politics. And by the way, the names that, that political scientists come up with this stuff, we've got dark money, soft money, hard money. It's like, could you be less descriptive? Anyway. Soft money is money that does not go to, I'm sorry, hard money goes directly to the candidate. That's hard money. Soft money goes to political campaigns. 
And I'm going to tell you about a different kind of money in just a second as well. So you could put as much money as you wanted into soft money campaigns. And there's an attempt to, to claw that back because obviously if you have say the Democratic Party getting unlimited amounts of money, it doesn't really matter in a way how little money a candidate is a candidate is getting so long as the Democratic Party supported that candidate because they could just beef up um, media coverage from the camp from the the DNC as opposed to from the the war chest of the candidate um, him or herself. Anyway, so the idea was to limit uh, limit those and to limit the amount of corporate and union money that was going into political ads, especially political ads within 60 days of an upcoming election or um, of a general election or 30 days of a primary election. So what they're trying to do there is to um, to try and stop these last minute swaying of an election the way, for example, and this is in a different category, the way Comey did before the election of 2016, when he came out right before the election and said that the FBI was investigating Clinton's emails again. We know that came to nothing, but it was very odd that they decided to do that right then, when, of course, at the same time, they refused to say anything about the fact that the Trump campaign was under a number of FBI investigations because of its connections to Russia. Anyway, the idea is that you don't want, there's, there's all kinds of studies in political scientists about, about independent voters. And what they've discovered is, in fact, there really isn't an independent voter. What there are are people who are um, willing to go back and forth, but they're, they tend not to be dyed in the wool people. They tend to be, you know, one week they might say they're going to vote for the Democratic candidate, one week they'll vote for the Republican candidate, and they are very susceptible to what they've heard most recently. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to try to, to get that out of, of the news. So for example, if you hear the day before an election that the guy you're gonna vote for is, you know, secretly, um, I don't know, sacrificing goats, goats on an altar in the middle of, I don't know where, you might have a different attitude about him than if you'd heard it two months before and had time to have it debunked. So they try and, and pull that out of the days right before an election. All right. So what happens after that is that um, one of the things that you're seeing here is the rise of a recognition of the psychology of voting, of the fact that what you really need to do is to control the psychology of voters. Um, you can make all these appeals to reason and, uh, and policy, but emotion is a really important aspect of voting. And this is something that's really pushed by Nixon's uh, campaign in 1968, when they quite literally say that, um, that it's much easier to manipulate emotions than it is to manipulate reason because it's much quicker, it's much easier. You don't have to have an argument. You only have to have images, for example, and you will never guess who is the person who comes up with this scheme and this system for Nixon, that would be Roger Ailes. Yes, the same guy who goes on to, um, to be instrumental in the founding of the Fox News Channel. And if anybody is interested, they actually the Nixon administration actually hires this guy named Harry Trelevin, who takes um, makes these amazing uh, videos uh, in 1968, amazing commercials. And some of you may remember them, but I think if you go and look at them on YouTube, you'll be shocked at how prescient they are and how how really what a phenomenal job um, Trelevin does with these images and with these these videos. And um, and they're they're just they're just really, really powerful images even today. And that was back in 1968. So what the what's trying what you're trying to do here is to try and pull that emotion, the government's trying to pull that emotional side out of the voting at the same time that it's actually really beneficial for candidates to hammer on that emotional hitting. And so you've got this increasing tension coming up there. So what happens is that um, uh, in 2010, we have a really major change in the in campaign finance law. And that is that with the uh, restriction of independent money going, uh, money going into independent um, organizations, soft money going into campaigns, the court holds that the limits on people being, on, I'm sorry, on corporations being able to give money, soft money to uh, political campaigns is unconstitutional because it's a limit to their free speech. And um, it, uh, the, the, the case is known as Citizens United, and it's Citizens United 
versus the Federal Elections Commission. Lots of people don't know that's the second half of the, 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 the court case. It's, we all talk about, about it as Citizens United. It's Citizens United v. FEC, uh, Federal Elections Commission. And that says that, um, that it's okay to go ahead and air those emotional, hard-hitting pieces much closer to an election day. And it comes up because uh, a, a pro-Trump organization wants to air a movie about Hillary Clinton, a, a, a really hit piece on Hillary Clinton right before the election. And when it goes in front of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says, yes, you can't limit either the timing of those things or, um, or the, the money that goes into that kind of soft money advertising. So what happens with that? That's in 19, I'm sorry, 2010. And with that, with Citizens United, you get then the idea that corporates, uh, corporations can pour any, any amounts of money into soft money ads, and they don't have to disclose what those are. And those, that's where we get the rise of the concept of dark money, that corporations can put money into organizations that advocate for a position that a uh, candidate holds without actually giving money to the candidate. And that first thing I just mentioned is legal. So we get the rise of dark money going into what are known as super PACs. And those super PACs are political action committees. And again, they're not technically tied to a candidate and they're not supposed to work with a candidate, but they can take all the money they want to advocate for a position. So what's interesting about that is that um, what this means is that there is a, just a rush of money into American elections in 2010, you know, after 2010. Well, you can see exactly where this is going, right? And one of the things that interests me, and this is only my gut sense as a historian, and I said this recently and everyone was, thought I was advocating this, and I'm not. I'm saying I can see with this door wide open why it became very tempting to accept Russian help or foreign help for an election. Because if it is okay, I mean, what's the difference? I mean, obviously there's a difference, one's legal and one's illegal. But if in the 21st century, if you're accepting millions of dollars from people with money, and uh, both parties accepted money from uh, an, uh, an oligarch with dual citizenship, What's really the difference if somebody isn't actually an American citizen? Now, of course, you and I know there's a difference. It's legal to have American money there. It's not legal to have foreign money there. But you know, where really you can see you can see how people would have stepped over the line and suddenly found themselves in a lot of trouble as they should have been. Anyway, so what is ha what happens from this? Um, in 2014, in another case called McCutcheon v. FEC, Federal Elections Commission, the Supreme Court rules that, um, that there is, uh, again, no restriction in how much money somebody can give to, uh, to uh, a, a PAC because it will violate their, their free speech. And then the door is wide open for 2016. Um, and actually, I may have misspoken. I may have said that, um, that Citizens United actually did that. It might have been McCutcheon. Um, I'm, I'm, I might have misspoke that when I said that because I was putting the two of them together. But the point is, what we have now is we have the door flung wide open to corporate money go ahead, going ahead and, um, and flooding our system. And why does that matter? It matters because if you have a lot of money for your campaign and you can simply throw it into the media um, and change the way people think, you are essentially being able to, if you will, I hate to use the word brainwash, but you are essentially able to control political outcomes simply by flooding the media, by flooding the zone of the media. As Steve Bannon said, the real enemy is not the Democrats, the enemy is the media. You need to, I'm sorry, flood the zone with excrement and, um, and, and, and go ahead and just basically blanket everything so that you, yours is the only voice that is heard and anybody who disagrees with you gets drowned out. And that's where we are right now. Um, and I, that, I, I just think that's a pretty important moment for us to be in. All right, so that's campaign finance. And now I want to go to a couple of other questions I will try and do more quickly. Um, I'm sorry, the history stuff is just interesting. Uh, let me do abortion next, shall I? Um, people asked about the history of abortion uh, in politics, not the history of abortion itself. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of abortion in American politics. 
and that is, um, first of all, uh, abortion has always been here, always will be here. And that's one thing historians say, and there, I'm sure there's somebody listening to me going, no, no, you're wrong. I'm just right on that. You know, it's, it's I, I mean, I could go through the history of societies, and but in America anyway, until um, the mid 19th century, uh, a woman was not considered pregnant until she felt quickening, which is the baby actually moving. And that could be at a number of months, actually, especially for a first pregnancy when you didn't actually know what a pregnancy felt like. Um, because, you know, even now people manage to have babies and not know they're pregnant. But um, so that was just simply a thing that was done. And, and that was known. And if you look at the advertisements for the period or the medical books for the period, there are a number of discussions in these books about how it's dangerous for a woman um, not to menstruate for months at a time. And so doctors have procedures for, you know, restoring that. Well, let's be real. What are we talking about here? And, um, and that's considered, you know, it's unhealthy for women to be, you know, not to be regular. So the doctors can restore that. Well, okay. Um, so what happens from that, one of the things that interests me is you do get the rise in the mid 19th century of concerns about abortion and concerns. It's not called abortion at the time, by the way. It's one of the things Cookie Roberts got in trouble with saying you didn't see the word abortion. So people hadn't had abortions. Uh, one of the words for it was malpractice or um, there's all kinds of different words for it. But it, during the Civil War in the 19, 1860s, people start to get kind of obsessed with abortion, but in a really interesting way. I threatened once to write something about this, and then it kind of slipped away. They're worried about abused immigrant girls. They're in the, their tropes in the northern newspapers anyway, again and again and again, about immigrant girls who have been taken advantage of and who die from self-inflicted abortions in always the same uniformly horrific way. It, it's, it was a trope. Um, but the, the idea is not really to protect the, the, the children, the, the, the fetuses, or the immigrant girls. The focus is really on the girls being taken advantage of by bad men. The focus is really on bad men. Now, this is going to change in the 1870s. And in the 1870s, there's a major change in uh, abortion regulations. And the reason for this is political. Um, and it's a fascinating story, and it has to do with the fact that it is technically illegal to advertise abortion services in newspapers, and yet something like two-thirds of advertisements in newspapers are about abortion. So what happens is, especially in New York, which is run by uh, Tammany Hall, a Democratic organization, the Democrats are basically, Democratic newspapers are basically able to get away with advertising for abortion services, and Republican newspapers aren't, because the government and the police and the judges come down on the Republicans. So the Republicans get really angry, and they're like, you know, we're going to go after this for everybody, because it's not fair, because they're the ones who are getting to have all this advertising. So it's the Democratic um, political arguments that are getting out into the open, because you keep shutting down our newspapers, and we're having trouble making ends meet, because we can't have the same advertisement they're they're doing illegally and you're letting them get away with so there's a great story there and someday I really will write about that but anyway it's a there's a move toward the the the, the criminalization of abortion beginning after 1871 but none what that does is it criminalizes abortion but by 1960 um there's real concern that this is a public health problem, the, the criminalization of abortion, because it's killing so many people. Uh, by 1960, an observer estimated that between 200,000 and 1.2 million illegal abortions were happening in America a year, which was um, killing women, especially women, poor women who didn't have the kind of workarounds that richer women did, who could afford to go to better doctors or could go to other countries where they were able to do it legally. So doctors actually are the ones who step into what they consider a public health crisis. And they start to talk about decriminalizing abortion in order to keep it between a woman and her doctor so they're not losing their patients to death. And in the 1960s, again, with this sort of idea of um, the techno technocrating of medicine, if you will, states begin to decriminalize abortion on that medical model. Let's take it out of the back alleys and put it into the doctor's offices. And with that support for abortion rights across the country begins to grow. Now, you'll notice right now I'm only talking about doctors. You also have the women's movement rising at this moment, but they do not initially jump on board this train, interestingly enough. Um, they, 
the early women's second wave of the women's movement begins to talk about women having control over their lives. And it's a, only a question of time until they see reproductive rights as key to controlling their lives. But interestingly enough, it's in 1969 that Betty Friedan, who is a feminist activist, actually goes to a medical convention. It's not the other way around. She goes to a medical convention and she says, my only claim to be here, you know, she's not a doctor, is our belated, too late, our belated, not maybe too late, it is late, my only claim to be here is our belated recognition, if you will, that there is no freedom, no equality, no full human dignity and personhood possible for women until we assert and demand the control over our own bodies, over our own reproductive process. And she goes on to say, women are denigrated in this country because women are not deciding the conditions of their own society and their own lives. Women are not taken seriously as people. Women are not seen seriously as people. So this is the new name of the game on the question of abortion, that women's voices are heard. Okay, so there's the switch. It starts as a medical thing, and now it's become part of the women's movement. But what's interestingly enough, uh, interesting, and it's also going to cause, by the way, a split in the women's movement between more affluent women and poorer women who have higher issues on their agenda than the issue of reproductive choice. But in 1971, the idea of, um, of women having control over their reproduction is widespread enough in America that even the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the biggest evangelical congregation in the country, agrees that abortion should be legal in some cases. And they vow to work for the moderation, you know, the, the, the modernization of abortion laws. And um, uh, they, they actually say um, in 1971, Whereas Christians in the American society today are faced with difficult decisions about abortion, and whereas some advocate that there be no abortion legislation, thus making the decision a purely private matter between a woman and her doctor, and whereas others advocate no legal abortion or would permit abortion only if the life of the mother is threatened, therefore, be it resolved that this convention expressed the belief that society has a responsibility to affirm through the laws of the state a high view of the sanctity of human life, including fetal life, in order to protect those who cannot protect themselves and be it further resolved that we call upon Southern Baptists to work for legislation that will allow the possibility of abortion under such conditions as rape incest, clear evidence of severe fetal deformity, and carefully ascertained evidence of the likelihood of damage to the emotional, mental, and physical health of the mother. That's the Evangelical um, uh, Southern Baptist Convention in 1971. All right, so by 1972, uh, pollsters at Gallup, uh, Gallup polling reported that 64% uh, of Americans agreed that abortion should be between a woman and her doctor, 64%. 68% of Republicans believed that. Republicans had always liked family planning, by the way. But 68% of Republicans in 1972 wanted to turn a, a abortion issues into uh, something between a woman and her doctor. And 59% of Democrats agreed. And you have to remember, of course, that in this period, the Democrats are going to have um, the, most of the most Catholic voters who and Catholics uh, generally have been historically opposed to abortion. They tended to vote Democratic. All right, so in 1973, we get um, Roe v. Wade, Roe versus Wade. And with that, um, the Supreme Court, which is uh, overseen by Chief Justice Warren Burger, who is a Republican, um, writes, uh, uh, the Supreme Court issues a decision that's written by Lewis Blackman, who is also a Republican. And in Roe v. Wade, they legalized first trimester abortion. And this is, of course, the, the case that involves uh, Norma McCorvey, who's known as Jane Roe. And she is herself an absolutely fascinating woman. Um, there is an obit of her in the LA Times that I don't believe is behind a paywall that just talks, it, it's a really, it's just a really beautiful and a very moving piece. Uh, it's an obituary that talks about um, 
about her, who she was and what her life looked like. And of course, we now know that she uh, filmed a video before she died in which she said her switch from being pro-choice to being pro-life was simply because she was paid by the pro-life, uh, by the pro-life side to switch. And that actually really brilliantly complements that, um, that LA uh, Times uh, obit, which is, I mean, who am I to tell you to go read obituaries? But but this is a, it's really a beautiful historical document. If I ever wrote about her, which I never will, um, I would definitely use that piece. Anyway, um, so what are we talking about here? This is a Republicans court that is uh, signing onto a decision by a Republican, written by a Republican. So uh, so what's going on here? Uh, there there is uh, has always been the idea that Roe v. Wade created a backlash and that there's a backlash against that, and that's the standard historical argument. But in fact, um, there are two legal scholars um, named, uh, one of them is Linda Greenhouse and the other is Reva Siegel, and they both looked really carefully at language around, around the time of Roe and what people were saying and what they were saying, and they wrote this phenomenal piece in the Yale Law Journal in 2011. And, and it's just it's just a mesmerizing piece because what they said is that um, you know the that even though I talked about how fewer Democrats than Republicans supported abortion rights in 1972, um, the other thing that's happening in 72 is that Nixon is up for re-election and Nixon is weirdly paranoid that he's going to lose in 1972. So um, and that itself is a fascinating story because of course he goes on to win by a landslide. So it just shows how totally paranoid he was. And of course, now we know he had reason to be because it turned out that he had um, sort of done a backdoor deal with uh, North Vietnam not to settle uh, under, um, uh, not to, to end the war under LBJ's plan. And obviously that would not have played well had anybody known about it. And we found out about it later. Anyway, um, Nixon's right-hand guy was a guy named Pat Buchanan, and Pat Buchanan, still alive, by the way, he had actually been a speechwriter for Goldwater, and he really wanted to destroy the, the New Deal state that, um, that he, I mean, he's an early Goldwater guy and movement conservative, and he was desperate to keep Nixon in power and to keep traditional Republicans and traditional Democrats, both of whom liked the New Deal state, out of power. So what he did is he um, was aware that Catholics tended to vote for Democrats. So he urged Nixon to get on board before the 1972 election on the abortion issue to try and attack, attract traditional Democrats over the issue of abortion into the Republican camp. And so what happens is, in fact, before the um, um, before the election in 1971, he began to reverse the course that he had taken, Nixon did, in so far over the issue of abortion. So in 1970, he had actually directed U.S. military hospitals to perform abortions regardless of what state law at the time said. That's in 71. I'm sorry, in 70. But in 71, he changed that. He completely changed that, trying to split the Democratic vote. And in the when he just changed that rule, he cited his personal belief as he said, quote, in the sanctity of human life, including the life of the yet unborn, unquote. And that's very deliberately Catholic language. Nixon, of course, was not Catholic. He was Quaker. Um, but he and um, George McGovern, the 1972 Democratic candidate, actually had very similar stances on abortion in their platforms. Nonetheless, in 1972, Nixon loads McGovern uh, with the, the epithet that he is the candidate of acid, LSD, acid amnesty, amnesty for draft, draft dodgers, acid amnesty and abortion. And the idea was to frame him as somebody who was antithetical to traditionalists. So Nixon was going to be the law and order candidate and McGovern, um, who actually had very similar policies over issues of abortion, was somehow this radical out there. Um, so, but what's interesting to me about this, among other things, is that um, as Nixon really deliberately splits America in, in 1971 and, and beginning of 1972 before the election, um, when they talk about abortion, they're really not talking about um, right to life the way modern day 
uh, uh, anti-abortion activists do. They're talking, they're using abortion as a stand-in for women's rights, which is really interesting. Listen to this. Phyllis Schlafly, who's an, an anti, uh, who's, a, who's a movement conservative, she's against um, the Democrats, she's against the idea of a, of a liberal state that's going to achieve equality of opportunity and equality before the law for all Americans. And she rails against the Equal Rights Amendment in 1972. And it's the first thing she ever says about abortion. She says, listen to this, women's lib, okay, so that's women's liberation, the idea that women should be equal before the law. Women's lib is a total assault on the role of the American wife, uh, I'm sorry, women's lib is a total assault on the role of the American woman as wife and mother and on the family as the basic unit of society. Women's libbers are trying to make wives and mothers unhappy with their career, making them feel that they are second-class citizens and abject slaves. Women's libbers are promoting free sex instead of the slavery of marriage. She's got that in quotation marks. They are promoting federal daycare centers for babies instead of homes. They are promoting abortions instead of families. Okay, do you see this distinction there that, that one is about you know, sort of traditional roles for women versus the idea that, um, that is now that abortion, this is something very much that anti-abortion activists now are walking away from. They're saying it's not about women's rights, it's about the rights of fetuses. Anyway, um, traditional Republicans like Betty Ford, for example, still approved of the idea of keeping abortion between a woman and a doctor and of promoting um, women's reproductive rights. But um, increasingly, the movement conservatives turned against that and attacked the idea that anybody who supported that was, um, uh, you know, anybody who supported the government uh, defending women's rights was actually a murderer, you know, was actually murdering fetuses. And this is, um, you, you can see the, the, the um, escalation of that language from this period until in 2016 when um, when Carly Fiorini stood on the, the stage at the Republican, one of the Republican national debates and said that Democrats were literally killing babies and selling their body parts. I mean, that's just nuts. But you can see how that language escalated until you got that, that very important moment in modern day, um, modern day uh, uh, political language. Okay, so tr increasingly people who objected to the idea of women taking equal roles in society really harp again and again and again on traditionalism and on traditional roles. And one of the things that, that I found fascinating about this is that um, there's a wonderful article, um, and unfortunately right now I'm drawing a blank on the woman's name. I'm so sorry, it's such a great piece. Anyway, um, uh, um, There's a great piece on how um, in 1974, we get the rise of the television show, Little House on the Prairie. And if you think about Little House on the Prairie, which I don't a lot, to be honest, but I did after reading this piece, um, Little House on the Prairie really emphasized sort of old Western traditional values, the idea of women at home, making a home, um, being taken care of by their men folk, which by the way, I'm sorry if you love Laura Ingalls Wilder, I do too for many reasons and there's lots of reasons not to like it, but Pa was a loser. You know, the idea that he was taking care of the family was exactly backward. It was Ma and the girls who always kept that family together. Pa never could find, find two nickels to rub together and if, he, if it was possible to screw up, Pa screwed up, you know. Um, he, he missed where they were supposed to, I'm sorry, I'll stop on Pa. Anyway, but that TV show, which ran from 1974 to 1983, really harps on the idea of women, but especially white women, being traditional wives and mothers. And that really um, sort of gets its teeth in the popular culture. And many of you will remember, if you came of age in that era, even things like prom dresses were called gunny sacks. That was that whole prairie dress period, if you will. Um, so you, by 1984, and this, of course, is the, the theme on which on which uh, Ronald Reagan rises to president with the, uh, the whole cowboy theme and the Western individualist, the man taking care of his women folk. And interestingly enough, in 1984, there's a there was a fascinating book written. I actually read it in, in um, I guess, graduate school, college, must have been college. Um, uh, there's a piece by a sociologist, a woman named Kristen Luker, who um, 
who actually interviewed people on, uh, on all sides of the abortion question. And what she discovered is that people who were pro-life activists were actually um, sort of culturally against the women that they believed were um, were getting abortions, not against the idea of protecting babies. It wasn't that they wanted to protect some babies so much as they believed that selfish pro-choice women were denigrating their own roles as wives and mothers. So it was really a, it wasn't really about the, the 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 fetuses and the children involved. It was about the women who were having abortions. They didn't want that because they believed that um, those women were denigrating their own choices as wives and mothers, but also increasingly were demanding rights from the government that cost tax dollars. They didn't want them to have legislation to enable them to live li lives as career women, to live in cities, to be Mary Tyler Moore, if you will. Um, in uh, in the Mary Tyler Moore show, they didn't want that. They wanted. They felt those women were implicitly attacking who they were, and you could see this by 1988 when you have uh, Rush Limbaugh, who of course is Rush Limbaugh, the voice of all this, the movement conservatism, um, virulently opposing you know special interest legislation and the taxation that paid for it, but also demonizing women who advocated for their rights as feminazis, as he called them, and he said for them quote. The most important thing in life is ensuring that as many abortions as possible occur. Well, that's just nuts, right? So that, I, as I said, I think leads pretty naturally to the 2016 declaration by Carly Fiorina that Democrats are murdering live babies to sell their body parts. And, um, and you know, you can see the, the escalation here of an attack on traditional society, on a traditional families, right down to the actual literal murder of babies. I mean, you know, is there a crime worse, you know? So, um, so that's sort of the history, the political history of abortion, how it went really from an attempt to split the vote in 1972 and to attract Democrats to uh, Democratic Catholic voters to the Republican standard to becoming increasingly an assault on the idea of an activist government that's going to level the playing field amongst all people in, in America, in, uh, including women. And that that is for many people, especially religious people, seen as an assault on the proper order of society, on the idea that the father should be over, the man should be over the wife and the children, which they, in many cases, believe is a reflection of, um, of God's order on society, and that any attack on that is uh, implicitly an attack on um, on religion and on the traditional society on which religion depends. So there you go. There's a lot on um, on uh, on abortion and on campaign financing, and that meant that I did not talk to you about um, emails and why emails are important and why the fight over um, the the DNC. And um, and the hacking of Rogers, uh, the the hacking of the DNC emails and Roger Stone's uh, conviction are so important. And I'm guessing that most of you would rather go have um, something to eat than think about that tonight. So I guess it'll have to wait. Um, if anybody is desperately interested, I did write about that. You know in. I did write about that last November, but you know what? I'll wait and do that. If you're still interested, I will do it next week. So just ask again. Sorry I went on too long about campaign finance and abortion, but you got to admit they're interesting. All right. Um, or maybe you don't have to admit it. I think they're interesting. Anyway, all right. It is July 14th. My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a history professor. I do not speak for my employer when I do these. I hope this was interesting. And I will uh, be back on Thursday at one o'clock talking about the Republican Party. Thanks a lot.